Okay, so thank you everybody for coming here. Um, uh, we'd like to talk to you about uh, how we believe that um, uh, linked open data could be uh, achieved in the cultural sector by, uh, you know, like ha getting into the um, the co-creation uh, world. Let's see. So first, a little word about BECT. Uh, so we are the Center of Expertise for Digital Heritage, uh, funded by the Flemish government. And uh, we started out as an um, institution for archiving of audiovisual heritage, um, but slowly grow, uh, grew into an organization that talks about all re processes related to digital heritage, such as cataloging, such as uh, uh, publishing your data, but also uh, reusing your data. Um, so, and our central concern is doing this in a sustainable way that uh, allows people to, uh, to access your data regardless of uh, your institution's sustainability. Uh, so before uh, I want to make an argument um, for opening up data, I want to kind of consider what uh, the museum is and who it is meant to serve. Uh, and I think if we take a, a historical perspective, uh, this is probably a good way to see how this shifted throughout time. So this is uh, a picture that uh, shows a imagination, imaginative uh, reconstruction of the, uh, the library in Alexandria. Uh, and this is probably the, the, the earliest attestation of what uh, led to the modern museum. Uh, but in fact, it's actually much closer to uh, uh, a university in uh, modern terms, since they do not necessarily uh, take after a collection. I mean, it was a library, but it's mostly a place that gathers scholars. So the other um, example, historically, uh, of the roots of the museum would be uh, the Cabinet of Curiosity from the Renaissance, uh, which, where you can see a very um, explicit focus on objects, but it's about showing all of the object because the point is not necessarily scientific study of these objects, but uh, to show them uh, how uh, the owner of these objects has an influence <coughs> in the world. And of course, the audience is mostly courtiers or uh, privileged visitors. And then finally, we arrive in the Enlightenment era, which has the, the roots of the truly modern museum in a certain way. Uh, but we're not quite there yet because um, uh, in the beginning, I guess it was also mostly about scholarship of objects, but putting them into a taxonomy, um, but not necessarily displaying them to large amounts of people. But this, of course, changed in the 19th century where uh, uh, museums would open them up to uh, large middle class audiences, uh, also as a way to bolster uh, national identity. Um, so here we really see this uh, combination of having a research community but also doing outreach and that is still very much reflected in uh, the, uh, def the modern I ICOM definition of what a museum is supposed to be. But we're going to try to make an argument uh, for um, how, this kind of, how this could be achieved, um, opening up your collection, studying it. Uh, in the, the digital era. So, because um, basically we believe that uh, consumer demands are changing, uh, and that's true in the um, commercial world, but also in museums. Uh, and I have two kind of central ideas that I think kind of link into this. Um, so the first thing would be uh, on the right, uh, that's a book written by Lawrence Lessig, <coughs> which is called Remix, uh, Making Art and Commerce Thrive in uh, the Hybrid Economy. It's mostly an argument uh, for uh, publishing uh, public domain works under uh, open licenses. Uh, but at the same time, it also makes an argument <coughs> for what he calls the uh, ecosystem of reputation, uh, which basically means that in the digital realm, uh, museums are already in competition which with quote unquote um, un, uh, let's say unofficial voices that are writing about their collections that actually have a quite large audience and I guess Wikipedia which uh, well, 
is what we're going to talk about later, is, is the prime example of that. And then apart from that, this graph is, uh, uh, represents the long tail. And uh, this is also kind of an idea that in uh, a digital world, basically uh, shops that have no physical manifestations, such as, for instance, the, the Amazon web shop, uh, they, um, they are, are able to sell uh, a lot of things that are in very low demand. So things that are interesting for people with a niche interest. But altogether, that creates a very large market. Um, so if you look at the middle pie chart, so for uh, Amazon, apparently that's 75% of all their sales. And if you apply that to uh, a museum content, content, we believe that <coughs> apart from your best sellers, if we can extend the, um, the analogy, uh, and a true open data strategy would allow you to serve quite a large part of people that you are not giving the tools or the raw data that they would like to work with. Um, so these are two central ideas that I think we want to uh, uh, argue for. Um, so I, I talked about the ICOM definition uh, earlier. So a museum is a non-profit uh, permanent institution in the service of society <coughs> and its development, uh, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and in that intangible heritage of humanity and uh, its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. So we believe that researching and communicating is now still mostly kind of uh, interpreted as institutions controlling the quality of uh, curated content that is made about their collections and also controlling access to the, their data. While we believe that in the future uh, museums should profile themselves as data publishers who uh, make it who share their data, who contextualize the, that data, but that also coordinate initiatives that do this and facilitate people <coughs> who are uh, interested in their data to do something with it externally from their uh, institution. Um, so uh, my uh, colleague Alina will tell you something about uh, accumulation and uh, registration of data. Hi. Um, so yes, I will be talking about, um, uh, we wanted to tell you uh, about what is going on in the back office uh, of the museums and some will talk later about uh, publishing um, front office uh, data. Um, so about accumulation and registration of uh, data, if I may uh, make a generalization, uh, it's not true for all institutions, but in overall for Flemish art museums, this is the situation. The back office um, uh, technology and infrastructure is not a popular topic to invest in. It's not something that you can make quick wins, fancy uh, <coughs> apps. Um, so it's often not uh, thought of or not in a main uh, vision of the institutions. There is often also no digital, <coughs> sorry, digital mindset. And uh, often the IT services are external, so there's no IT personnel in the museum, so you're often very dependent on these external providers. Uh, the data is messy and not complete. We're talking about basic registration of art objects, but the whole context of it is just, there's just no time to do that. But there's a lot of knowledge in these institutions. Um, it, the data is captured on different carriers, so in systems, but also still in analog paper uh, dossiers, um, on other Excel outside of the system, so it's a, uh, it's a big uh, chaos. And it's, they're often still used um, in like closed and obsolete software. So there, when you ask questions about linked open data, it's often very difficult to, to um, um, put it in the situation of, of this software. Um, for audiovisual material, and I'm talking about the reproduction, for example, of artworks, um, there's a lot of digital asset management systems in the market, but um, <coughs> they're all not, not <coughs> good enough, and there is still an analog mindset of uh, making a copy of the image for every project. You make a copy, you put it somewhere on one uh, computer, on the other computer, so you have a lot of 
different copies and audiovisual material is not seen as a resource that you can uh, always um, uh, take for, for different projects. Um, we at PACT had a chance to initiate a series of projects um, on optimizing um, this data in museums. And this is a project on a data hub that we did together with the Flemish Art Collection. It's a partnership between the Fine Arts Museums, KMSKA, Groningen and MSK Gens. Um, some contemporary art museums also took part. And uh, it was a project on analyzing the um, the infrastructure that is now, the outdated infrastructure, and making a plan for the future for a better platform that can help museums to function as these online knowledge sources. And I will talk about uh, the end of the, the, the end goal of this project was making a data hub for these museums, which aggregates the data from the collection management systems and puts it um, uh, via an API um, as, um, as open data for reuse. Um, I wanted to talk about different projects around this data hub for you to, to see what's, what's going on and what kind of open data principles we tried to implement in the cultural heritage sector. And so for the first, uh, the first uh, question was the persistent URIs, persistent identification of artworks. Um, uh, which here is a link of um, an artwork to an artwork from 2012 of uh, SMAC. Uh, which of course doesn't work now because the museum has a new website. So if you're a researcher or I don't know who saved this link into your uh, data set, you have uh, um, a problem. Uh, what we did is looked for um, um, uh, um, a way for this persistent URIs and persistent identification of artworks um, to be um, um, implemented by the museum workers themselves. So not, again, an external IT service, which you have to call every time for every um, persistent URI to be made, but a resolver a tool um, that can be used by the collection managers themselves, um, which we, um, which we uh, um, developed ourselves. It's an open source tool. The code is on GitHub. Um, and now, for example, you have a persistent URI for an artwork that resolves to the, the, the uh, for now, just the HTML uh, page about an artwork, but in the future, um, you can uh, uh, put whatever you want behind it. Um, but the problem is, is that this, this resolver tool um, <coughs> is still, the persistent URI is still a concept that is too hard to, to process for collection managers. And, um, um, this tool needs to be um, developed further uh, for it to be a success um, in the cultural heritage. Uh, we also played around with enrichment of data via external authorities, so also what uh, you talked about, uh, uh, taking uh, data from external um, authorities uh, and adding it to your uh, data. Um, which was uh, very interesting to see how all of this uh, I think it's the example of Peter Bruegel uh, that has different uh, kinds uh, of, of his name notations which you don't have to copy paste anymore as a collection manager but um, which you can just take uh, um, from, from other authorities. Um, all this um, <coughs> stuff we also tested how you can internally reuse all this uh, linked data from different museums, if you aggregate them in one data hub, uh, for example, visualizations like um, the acquisition source, like where do artworks come from into a museum. Um, and uh, you could see all of these the, like artworks from the church, artworks from the artist, artworks from the king that were uh, given to a museum, so fun. Um, stuff to see also just for the internal um, business process of the museums. Uh, the data hub, the beta version is also on GitHub, so it is now tested by uh, museums um, on the data is being aggregated from the uh, different management systems. Um, so we are uh, looking forward to the feedback um, of the museums. <coughs> and for the audiovisual material, um, 
We also, um, my colleagues looked into the, uh, um, the situation on, on reproductions and made a, a blueprint for um, a distributed, distributed um, management of this material uh, using IIIF and this kind of um, uh, open principles. Um, uh, yes, and now, so this, uh, all these projects made it possible for us to start uh, testing the linked open data publication uh, for the cultural sector, and this is where some. Uh, <coughs> all right, so um, basically, uh, PACT started with uh, um, open data publication with a, a website called Open Culture Data uh, in 2012, and uh, it was. Not very successful in the sense that it, it, it's data dumps which uh, have outdated uh, information. And also, the developer community didn't really find their way to the platform. So, that's obviously, uh, I think, something I heard a lot of people talk about uh, today. So, um, basically, PACT started looking elsewhere. Um, and uh, you are probably all. all I don't know if I have to explain, but I'll say everybody is basically aware of the Wikipedia, the encyclopedia, but apart from that, of course, there is a, a Wikimedia ecosystem <coughs> of platforms that work together. Uh, Wikidata, the database, and Wikimedia Commons, the audiovisual uh, repository, uh, which uh, provided us uh, a possibility to, um, to start um, opening up collections. Uh, and why did we choose for Wikimedia? Uh, First and for all, it, it's uh, a living system. So um, not only will people reuse your data, uh, they will also engage with it. So they, they might add data, they might uh, link it to other sources. Uh, and also, of course, uh, very much to the country or the website, it has a much larger visibility. So people will find their way uh, to your, the data that you publish. Um, so, um, as Alina already explained, since, uh, uh, well, since um, persistent identification is a uh, basic condition for uh, linked open data publication, uh, those uh, persistent identifications are already there for uh, a number of fine arts museums in Belgium. Um, so, uh, the second step was to get them to publish a very limited amount of uh, data fields such as uh, a title, creator, uh, some uh, dating information, for instance. And together, uh, 27,000 uh, uh, works had their, uh, had their data published uh, on Wikidata. Voila. So then the second step was, um, how do we get images of reproductions for that? Uh, because as many of you might know, um, uh, the, the first decade, decade of, uh, um, uh, of digitization was done according to a business model which uh, made the organizations claim a, a, a copyright on their images. Uh, so first and for all, um, we started doing a crowdsourcing project uh, with Wikimedia Belgium, which is called Wiki Loves Art, so this is a still from it, where we would go to museums um, to ask them if we could go on a tour, if we could do, for instance, like a real photography setup to make reproductions of their artwork. And uh, Romana from Wikimedia Belgium is right there, so he helped me a lot for the process. Um, so this was an interesting uh, format because, uh, one, it didn't require the museum to change its uh, uh, right management state, uh, statements uh, immediately. Uh, and it also didn't require them to give their repro uh, reproductions. Um, but, of course, uh, these are uh, not always the kind of images that uh, have the same quality as, like, a, of course, a reproduction that's made in a studio in high resolution with the right uh, color, um, color settings. Uh, so basically, we, we are right now asking um, these museums to, um, to give us reproductions of a decent resolution and uh, the coupling of the Wikidata information to images has already been done for the Huenia Museum for uh, 842 uh, works. Uh, so that's 
a, a finished uh, project that we're happy of. Um, and uh, we're trying to get all these other museums to also uh, see whether they can do this, uh, which is, of course, not always simple because, of course, there's also SMUC, uh, Contemporary uh, Art Museum, in there. Uh, so what happens once uh, organizations uh, publish their data? So what's interesting is there are, there are already a lot of very uh, nice tools uh, that are created by the Wikimedia community. It's a little vague here. Uh, but, uh, for instance, right there you can see that uh, this query is basically for this Huni Museum set that we just talked about. Uh, how many views these uh, images got altogether for the month of January 2018. And as you can see below, uh, that is uh, 44,987 views, which is, is quite impressive. Uh, so we're trying to make uh, institutions to think about that kind of visibility, uh, apart from what uh, they are already used to. Um, and furthermore, these tools give you like uh, interesting information, for instance, uh, in which uh, articles um, the content is used. So that's not necessarily only an article about a specific painting, but it can also be a theme that's related to it, for the French Revolution, for instance, um, or a movement. Um, so it can be kind of reapplied in many different ways. And you can even check when it's when it gets peaks, because for instance, if there's a, a temporary <coughs> exhibition uh, going on, uh, obviously a lot of people are looking for that data. Um, and yeah, you see a lot of interesting curating uh, uh, um, uh, projects that are done by the volunteer community. For instance, this is a fur fashion in 1562. So we, we just noticed that one of the images that we um, uploaded uh, was of a man, uh, I think he's, let's see, uh, yeah, it's, it's over here, it's a little vague, but uh, it's basically a painting of somebody with a medieval fur coat, and uh, this is put into a collection that is curated on Wikimedia Commons uh, about fur fashion throughout the century. It starts in the third century uh, AD, and it goes all the way up to the present day. And uh, this is perhaps not something a museum would work on because they are concerned with their collection, but nonetheless, it's a very uh, fun example, I think, of something that happened almost immediately after we, uh, we published uh, the image. Uh, and apart from that, uh, obviously, uh, content, data, and images um, on the Wikimedia ecosystem does very well in Google rankings. Uh, so apart from... Uh, uh, the fact that it will, it usually shows up uh, very high in uh, Wikipedia Commons. Uh, you have the Google search box, which draws content from Wikipedia, but also uh, images from Wikimedia Commons and some, uh, some data over there. So it provides a, a very nice visibility. Um, what we also noticed is that uh, uh, data does get enriched. Um, so for instance, uh, this data about exhibition history, uh, this is not something we added, so that was added by some, somebody externally. And uh, as you can see, Urbiana uh, 280 there is referenced, so uh, it's high quality data. And underneath, um, you see that uh, certain iconographical uh, information is actually uh, referenced using uh, standardized um, standardized code, so it's, it's the data that the heritage sector wants to work with. Um, but the problem right now is uh, <coughs> how do you harvest this data to get it back to uh, the, the data of the institutions? Uh, at the moment, there is uh, no automatized uh, way, and certainly not a way that um, uh, a collections registrator with uh, no particular IT background can can just get it out of Wikipedia, at least not on an automatized way. Um, and we also, we did notice that some uh, data definitely uh, travel. So uh, for instance, this is the uh, uh, virtual international authority file. So it's uh, information about creators of artwork, for instance, uh, or uh, persons. And uh, this is the record of James Ensor. And, uh, 
uh, obviously that was one of the, the data sets uh, that was released on a certain creator and it's now used by VIOF, so they har harvest our data. Um, and furthermore, there are all kinds of neat tools um, that are already there uh, that you can use to visualize uh, your, um, your collections. So obviously if you have re reproductions, images and data, you can do all sorts of nice stuff like bubble charts or timelines, obviously. Um, you can map your entire collection on a timeline like this, for instance, without you really having to uh, write software or create something new. Uh, and this, for instance, is a, a tool created um, that's called Kotos. Um, and basically, if, um, if you do have your collection um, released with the images, uh, you're able to automatically generate uh, a catalog for your uh, your collections. So we would like to see more of those tools uh, that are uh, easy to use and that are um, uh, interesting for the cultural sector to be created in the future. So let's go uh, to the conclusions so we can go to the questions. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so short the, the conclusions and the next steps. Um, why why were we talking about linked open data in limbo? Um, it's because the institutions uh, still, the museums <coughs> still struggle uh, um, about this, this uh, concept. And it's often um, uh, too, too um, um, uh, extreme. Yes, between two extremes, and and uh, the one is wanting to participate in this digital movement, but having no digital mindset or no vision on how to do it, they want to reduce uh, cost um, on IT uh, uh, apps, but it often also can end up in an out of control IT budget if you don't do, you do it sustainable. So you keep on adding stuff, you keep on. Um, uh, yeah, the, the collection management systems um, adding stuff and it just uh, goes out of control. Um, you have the new digital audience that are uh, good with smartphones, but you also have an audience that uh, still uh, doesn't use any digital um, um, software and, and um, apps. So how do you how do you um, um, how do you interest? both of these, uh, these audiences. <coughs> there is also a very hard pressure, budget-wise also, to show off with fancy tools and let know that you have, uh, uh, that you're <coughs> participating, but uh, often get locked up in obsolete technology, so you keep on creating um, new um <coughs> applications. And uh, you want to engage with the crowd, but then you have a, a mass of abandoned web portals that nobody ever uses because nobody knows they're there. Um, <coughs> so this is kind of the limbo uh, situation. Uh, our wish list uh, would be um, for ASAP more IT profiles in the cultural heritage sector because we really see that if somebody with uh, an uh, uh, open Belgium um, mindset comes into the institutions, it really goes uh, uh, faster. Um, there, there also, this, is, this one is also talked about today, there should be more freedom to play around and to test things out. The budgets that the museums get now is just you have like one try and it should be good. You know, if you if you're fail, then you, you don't, you lie about it, you don't talk about it. Uh, but you should get the, the, the freedom to, to uh, play around <coughs> because the, 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 the tools that there are now are often should, should like be um, made or uh, customed for institutions and, and there's not like one um, uh, resolving um, service for everything um, so playing around is very important. Uh, better open infrastructures and tools, so for back office, the collection management systems that are, are being used now are very um, uh, often closed and obsolete. More uh, tools that um, give the possibility to publish open data online. Uh, more examples of reusing um, 
uh, like Wikimedia uh, data reusing um, and stuff like that. And um, I don't know if you see that, the uh, more vocal and demanding audience, because we are um, often find ourselves in the loop of, yes, but nobody is asking open data, so why should we do it? And then the, the reusing community says, yes, there is no open data, so we don't have examples of um, how we want to reuse it. Um, so <coughs> this is what uh, we need to uh, break out of. Um, um, PACT uh, for the, our future plans is um, to work further on this data hub project. We are, um, we are giving our resolver tool to the open summer of code uh, in the hope that um, uh, something uh, better uh, will come out of it, a better uh, usable tool. Um, we have a set of Wikimedia projects like about uh, publishing um, um, artworks that have come into public domain yearly, like structural publishing of data and uh, images. Um, also reusing uh, this information in Wikipedia articles but also outside of the plot platform. We're also looking for um, the current, uh, we wanted to do a survey on the current demand of uh, cultural heritage data uh, by various sectors, so not only the, the traditional tourism but, but outside of it, the research, the digital humanity communities, etc. So if you see yourself contributing to any of these questions or the wish list uh, that you have seen, um, do you have ideas or feedback, uh, uh, please contact us, we are very uh, eager to hear. So, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? This is the big aggregator of the, the um, data from all European um, cultural heritage institutions. But what we have seen after um, the years of this project is it's also it's very hard to to build this one big aggregator. Um, uh, for example, nobody thought of uh, asking for persistent URIs to uh, reproductions when they took data in. So now the a lot of museums are just shown like the error with the picture because um, so now they have to do it again. Um, the data hub, uh, which which are is built in this project, is is um, um, I think the I think the future is is behind um, smaller data hubs, which then go higher and higher because if you create one big thing, um, then it it is hard to to. Um, make it sustainable, to control it, to, to, uh, to let it be accessible f on long term, you know. So, um, and the code is open source, I think it is uh, a possibility that more museums could go into this data hub. But of course, also one of the problems that we are working with, it's, it's because it's, um, it's project budget. So you have a you have a, a one project and and um, you you need to fit it in some kind of a, you know uh, which which is really a risk for sustainability of this kind of projects. But we we hope by by doing it in open source that it will uh, create a community around it. Okay. Yeah. Quick question. Does it have a sparkle endpoint to data? Can we interface with it? Uh, I think it's the OIE. Uh, I think <laughs> it's the, you have to, to 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 be with my other colleague for this kind of questions. But it's a it's a, it is the possible. There is a, a an API which which you should get possible to get data out of it. But I don't think it will be sparkle. I think it's uh, the data that is in there is uh, Lido XML. And I think to get it out, um, um, you so should. So there are no triples. 
Mm? There are no triples. Yes, it, uh, it's, I think it's, uh, it is like uh, a triple data, but you really should be with my other <laughs> colleague, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes? Uh, to answer this maybe part of the question, Wikidata query is uh, actually Sparkle. Yes, yes. Yes, so all yeah, of the, the data, data like if I want to query another museum and link it to ours, mm -hmm. I have to go through Wikidata, which is absurd. Mm. Well, yeah, no, like the also maybe it wasn't clear from our presentation, the data hub and Wikidata um, tests are next to each other. Yeah, I know. So yeah. you have the, the data hub where more data will be available. The Wikidata was a test to show how you can also use platforms, free platforms that are already available um, online. So yeah. We'll come sparkle in. Yeah, then maybe yeah, be clear uh, on on uh, these on the Wikimedia ecosystem. It's a way to display and open up your collection, uh, but it can never be uh, never serve as the same. Uh, yes, purpose. yes, as your as your own um, online uh, source because also everything that's on Wikidata should be referenced should be referenced. So you cannot create. You cannot put original content on these platforms. So it's always important that your own uh, source online keeps existing as a source of the original information. Okay.